Focusing on any positive step, holding on to that, dwelling in that, and building that. Being vegan is aspiring to live as kindly as possible. And so that's kindness to other animals, it's kindness to other people, it's kindness to ourselves. Because I think sometimes in the vegan world, you know, we can be pretty upset about humanity and, and pretty angry about what our species does on the planet. And that's a rational position to take, uh, but it's not necessarily a, a healthy one over time. It can kind of turn us into pretty angry folks. And, and, and again, there's a lot of good reasons to be angry, but it doesn't necessarily help advance our cause. For me, focusing on any positive step, holding on to that, dwelling in that, and building that is the way that I think we can have success. And I also think that in our movement, there's a lot of diversity of opinion about this is a good thing or that's a bad thing. I think diversity is good. It's good to have different opinions. You know, Benjamin Franklin said, if everybody thinks the same way, nobody's thinking, right? And at the end of the day, none of us has all the answers. So it's important for us to all listen and learn as we go, constantly. Because things change, the system changes, the context changes. But we're all, I think, you know, interested in very much the same things. Preventing unnecessary harm to others, living in a way that you know, we're eating food that doesn't make us sick, and supporting a food system that doesn't destroy the planet. So if we can frame it in those terms, it's pretty hard for people to disagree, right? I mean, most people are not for causing other animals to suffer needlessly. So I think we've got an awful lot going for us. One of our biggest obstacles, though, is the machinery, the system, and habits. And people just sort of going along and doing what they do because it's what we do and it's easy to do. And it's important for us, I think, also to be patient, to be persistent, and to just realize that it's going to take a long time to create the kind of world we dream about. But in the meantime, you can visit Farm Sanctuary. It's kind of there. So uh, I guess I'll just sort of finish with that and, and like open it up to questions. And, yeah. Just a quick question. You mentioned the pigeon shoot. Are you familiar with the turkey drop in Yaleville, Arkansas? Yes. Is that still going on? Thankfully, last year it did not happen. So in Yaleville, Arkansas, Annually, they had this turkey drop where this plane would literally drop a turkey out of the plane, a domesticated bird who cannot fly. And thankfully, we and some other groups started making some noise about that, and they decided not to do it. But, you know, that sort of activity speaks to the disrespect that humans will show to other animals. Oh, and by the way, some of those yellow little turkeys from not last year, but the year before, came to live at Farm Sanctuary. When we treat others badly, there's a tendency to want to denigrate the victims of our abuse. And it's kind of a pattern of abuse. And an example of this, you know, beyond Yelma, which is a very obvious one, is when somebody calls you a turkey or calls you a pig, it's not a compliment, right? So this is an implied way of denigrating turkeys and pigs. And most people have never met these animals. I remember hearing over and over when Farm Sanctuary first started, the turkeys are really dumb. I mean, this is part of the narrative that we tell ourselves to enable ourselves to do things that are not really aligned with our empathy and our humanity. But with turkeys, one of the stories was they're so dumb, they'll go outside and drown in the rain. And you know, we've been taking care of turkeys for over 30 years, they can go in the barn, they can come outside. We've never had one go out and drown in the rain, right? So there's these stories we tell ourselves that we need, I think, to critically evaluate and think about. How did you scale it from one or two farm sanctuaries to 100 locations? And can you kind of explain how that model um, works? Well, so farm sanctuary didn't really scale it. We, we do our thing, and there's a bunch of other sanctuaries that have popped up. And I think in the sanctuary movement, we're actually realizing now that it can get pretty big and pretty costly. And at the end of the day, uh, rescuing animals is not going to change the system that we need to change. If we rescued a million animals a year, it would still be a drop in the bucket. And no sanctuary can rescue anything close to that. So the animals who come to Farm Sanctuary become ambassadors, and we need to tell their stories to reach more people. So we have a sanctuary now in Washington, New York, one in Acton, California, just outside of Los Angeles. There are a number of other sanctuaries closer to the city, and literally all around the world, that we are in touch with. 
But in terms of a model, that's actually not really been created. You know, it's a bunch of groups doing various things, similar things. But in some cases, they can get out of hand, right? And running sanctuaries, you kind of deal with an impossible ethical reality, which is that ethically, every one of those animals needs to be rescued. And it's impossible. And, and this is where, like in the rescue world, not only with farm animals, but generally speaking, you know, there are folks that have issues with hoarding, right? Because they can't say no, and they keep going. <clears throat> An old friend of mine, Jim Mason, I don't know if anybody remembers Jim Mason, he wrote the book Animal Factories back in like 1980, I think. He said, animal rescue is like the crack cocaine of the animal movement, because it's an immediate fix. And you can feel good about something you did, but you know, you can't keep doing that, especially when it comes to farm animals. Last year, we had calls for, I think, over 40,000 animals that needed homes. We can't do, you know, so sanctuary model is evolving, like everything. And I think that sanctuaries, in addition to being a place for animals to live and to be seen as friends, not food, and to create opportunities to interact in magical ways that have profound impacts on people, can also become increasingly vegan living centers and training centers where people actually learn how to grow food. They learn wellness, they learn how to cook. They learn what they can do when they leave the sanctuary. Because, you know, not everybody can run a sanctuary, but everybody eats. And how we eat has profound impacts on the animals who will or will not be able to come to the sanctuary. So the sanctuary model is evolving. And it you know, it's been around since 86, so it's fairly new. And it's great to see the interest. In, but I think we're at a point now of, assessment and discernment of, okay, how do we now leverage this to maximize the impact? And that's a process we're all kind of working through together. Yeah. I mentioned the Impossible Burger, which has become a bit of a... You know, includes like a certain heme iron that I guess is a genetically modified product. And Apparently, it was done through animal testing of some sort. I don't honestly know the details. And it has become somewhat controversial, yes. And, you know, my view, you know, there's idealism and pragmatism. And I'm always trying to balance these things. So, my net view of the Impossible Burger is it's a positive thing. It's reducing suffering more than it's causing suffering. Is it perfect? No but it's also intended largely for meat eaters. But, but it's an important question, and, and I don't have an easy answer. You know, and I'm taking more of a pragmatic approach, saying I'm for it, and I am. But I do understand people who might be upset about how it was produced. So it, it's not a black and white world, and I don't have an easy, it's a good thing or it's a bad thing. There's good things about it, and there's bad things about it. And for me in that, when I look at does the good outweigh the bad? And I think it does. Other people might disagree, and that's okay, right? We can have different opinions, and that's okay. Yeah. I think it's a great idea to take subsidies away from the meat industry, but how do you think we the people can make that happen? How can we the people take the subsidies <laughs> away from the industry? <laughs> well, one of the most important ways to do it every day is how we vote with our dollars. One of the reasons that this industry is so powerful in Washington is because many consumers are buying their stuff and that's building their war chest to go to Washington to invest in the political process. And they've been investing in it for decades. So it's gonna take time to change policy so that it is more plant friendly. But there are little inklings of it, you know, like Finney, you know, this program I mentioned that incentivizes fruits and vegetables. There was also more money put into developing like grants for organic innovations. There's some positives there. I think though where a lot of the change is gonna happen is in the marketplace. And I think the marketplace is gonna eventually change political practices. Because the politicians do what the businesses tell them for the most part. So I think that's the first thing we can do as citizens. But then it is also important to get to know our elected officials. And each of us has different connections. You know, we might know somebody who's the chief of staff for some congressperson. You know, each of us has certain opportunities. And I think to utilize those opportunities to create discussions about these issues. My girlfriend actually works at the USDA. And she was able to get a story on farmers.gov 
about a vegan farmer in New Jersey who's also a doctor doing food as medicine who has vegan pockets. And he gets money from the government to put in pollinator habitat. So, so there is money available in Washington. And it's a matter of the organic folks and the plant-based folks going and getting it. Animal agriculture you know, has the lobbyists. They lobby for these laws. They know where the money is, and they go get it. So what has to happen is I think we need to start this is where I think if sanctuaries were growing food, we were getting money from the government to do it. It'd be pretty cool. You know, so, but it's going to be small incremental steps. And each citizen, again, voting with our dollars and getting to know our elected officials to the extent we can and just weighing in on the issues. And, you know, Farm Sanctuary has an email alert list, so sign up for that. If there are timely issues that are happening in Washington or in your area, in New York or wherever it is, we'll send an alert and then we'll ask you to please write. And so that's another way to keep kind of apprised of it. But also contact us, you know, if you have ideas. But a big part is going to be the businesses supporting the organic bill. By the way, huge shout out to Vlad and Olga for doing this. <laughs> if you have not eaten there, I recommend it. And their vegan omelets are amazing. But it's a process. And I think we need to realize it's going to take time. And the machine that we have currently in Washington and the infrastructure and agriculture <laughs> took a long time to build. But Part of that infrastructure are things like Burger King. And so if you can now slot out a beef burger for an impossible burger, right, and put it in that machine. Another thing about Burger King, you know where the first veggie burger was sold in the U.S. from Burger King? Watkins Spring. Watkins Spring. <laughs> the way that happened was that, you know, we have the farm, have many visitors who want to find vegan food. So we started contacting restaurants in Watkins Glen, asking if they'd have a vegan item on their menu. And we thought, well, what the heck, let's ask Burger King. And the franchise owner was very sympathetic. And so he introduced the BK, who actually they brought in the spicy bean burger from the UK at the time. This is like 1992. It did very well, sold out within a couple weeks. They brought it in again, sold out, brought it in again, sold out. Then they had to find a domestic product because they couldn't keep shipping it in. They used the griller, which had egg whites in it. So we stopped eating it, but a lot of other people kept eating it. And then they did the BK Veggie Nationwide. But again, that was like activism consumer-based that then reached a company and look what's happening now. And the other day I was driving and I was listening to NPR and Freakonomics came on. I don't know if anybody heard this story about the Impossible Burger and about how it's much more efficient than animal agriculture and how the price has been coming down. So I was happy to hear that. You know, so this is a process and it's gonna take time. And I think incremental steps, while not perfect, often lead to more steps. And you know, as an early vegan activist, Somebody told me they don't eat veal. One of my first reactions might be, well, what about dairy, <laughs> right? Because the veal industry is literally born out of the dairy industry. These are the unwanted male calves born on dairy farms that were not useful to the dairy industry. So the veal industry was created to use all these unwanted male calves. So I would say, well, what about dairy? But instead now, what I would say is that, you know, it's great that you don't eat veal and it's celebrated. I tell them what they're doing right instead of tell them what they're doing wrong. And then you celebrate what they're doing right and you build from there. So that for me has been part of my learning, part of my lesson over time. And there are times when you need, you know, hardcore activism. And there are other times when you're more, you know, there's the Martin and the Malcolm, right? Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. There are roles for all of these different types of approaches, I think. I'm just wondering, especially now as we're seeing such a cultural zeitgeist around environmental plant-based eating and health plant-based eating as animal rights vegans, as you termed it. How do you see us potentially joining forces with those movements? Because on the big agri side, they're all sort of united because they have different goals, but they work together to kind of make them happen. But we seem to be kind of fractured by our ideologies, even though we want the same end goal. I think that we have really great opportunities now to align with environmental groups. I think health and wellness people too, honestly. I mean, you know, we could save something like 70% on healthcare costs in this country by shifting to a whole food plant-based diet. That's why it's so great with doctors like Rob that in the hospitals. That's another alignment. But in terms of the political process, as you indicate, there is sometimes fracturing within our world. Believe it or not, there's fracturing in the other world too. And one example of this is like the ag-gag laws. I mean, there's some industry people that are all for the ag-gag laws. And other industry people like Temple Grandin saying, that's the dumbest thing to do. It makes look, make, looks like we're trying to hide something. Well, some people are. And Temple Grandin, there's mixed things about her too. Temple, I think, has a genuine concern about animals. 
and she wants them to not suffer as much going to the slaughterhouse. So she designed these slaughterhouse systems that are less stressful. So that's what she was looking at. The industry wanted the animals to move faster. And if they're less stressed, they move faster. So they're making more money, so they like that. And then they explain her name to say we're humane. So looking at the system and looking at individuals within it, how they can be used. And I think in our movement, sometimes people who are righteously indignant about something, and it's important to speak out, but sometimes within our movement there's a lot of internal stuff that I don't think is very healthy. And I think that it's okay to have different opinions. We need to have different opinions. But how do those manifest becomes the big question. And where do we spend our energy? Do we spend our energy attacking each other? Or do we spend our energy going to the bigger thing? And that goes within the animal movement, within the vegan movement, within the environmental movement, and the animal environmental. So the way that I think we're better able to work with environmental folks is to be less stringent in some cases. And we are a vegan organization. We will always be a vegan organization. And when it comes to certain environmental folks, a lot of them now are into grazing animals as green and from our standpoint that is not green and the animals are still being killed so we'll never say it's good but we will say it's less bad than industrial factory farming right so it's really trying to call it as it is and to be very honest about it and you know less bad is not as bad as more bad but it's still not good <laughs> so you know we ultimately want to create the good thing but that's a process and we don't have machinery right now for veganic agriculture. There's a couple folks I know who did a survey of veganic farms around the US, and there's not very many of them, and they don't, they're still working out how do you do that? How do you get the nutrients? And then there's also this push now by Patagonia, Brodale, and Dr. Bronner's, who are all kind of progressive to create this regenerative agriculture thing, which in some ways is very good, but they're very much into the grazing animal things. So that's not good. So for me, it's, it's about identifying the positive parts, recognizing the negative parts, trying to push the positive ones. And when you're talking about policies, like in Washington, D.C., you know, if it's going to be all vegan, you're probably not going to get it. You know? But the, the thing about Finney, that's all fruits and vegetables. So, and, and, and that's, I think, a very strong position to take. So I think that for our movement to work with other movements, we're going to have to, in some cases, tolerate things that we don't want to tolerate. First of all, thank you guys for all your work. I wanted to give a little public service announcement regarding politics and veganism. We have someone that not all of you might know about, Borough President Eric Adams. Have you guys heard of him? Yes. Mm -hmm. He's working in the vegan industry. Yeah, he got Meatless Mondays put in all the New York City hospitals. He also got it put in the New York City schools. He also got the first vegan clinic with Dr. Michelle McMacken at Bellevue Hospital. And he's also now getting yoga and meditation in the classrooms. Why? Because he can't change what's happening at home to the kids and their traumas before they come to school and get learning shoved at them. But what he can do is get them prepared to accept the learning for their work day. So, yeah. So you guys spread the word. He's BP Eric Adams on Instagram. I'm not paid, this is not, <laughs> I'm not here for that. <laughs> oh. And he's running for mayor. Yes, that's what I meant to say, he's running for mayor. You know, democracy is a participatory sport. You've got to show up. Yeah. And also I think what he's doing in Brooklyn is trying to integrate plant-based healing into the machinery of the hospital, right? So that is where infrastructure-wise it's really important too. Up at night is just thinking about from where I sit, it always just seems to me like we're just not as organized as we could be. And I just wonder whether you've seen a change over the last 20, 30 years. Like, why are we not like the NRA or a corporation where we're all doing like very synchronized things? We have our parts that we play and then we all show up on certain events. And like, why, why aren't we there yet? That's, I'm just curious what your thoughts on that are. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, this is a movement that's driven by passion. And, and also reason sometimes, and it's kind of uncharted ground, you know, so there are sometimes very strong opinions, we've got to do it this way, this is how it's going to work. And then somebody's like, we've got to do it that way, this is how it's going to work, right? And none of us really know, right? So we're learning as we go. But there are groups that do communicate and learn from each other. 
There is you know, this effective altruism movement, which is attempting to measure impact for cost. They're very pragmatic in that sense. And I think that's generally a good thing, but I would also say that sometimes it's pretty hard to measure social movements in a very concrete way. But there are efforts to figure out how to be as impactful as possible. And a number of people that have been involved in animal work for years are now going more into the business side of things. Working with plant-based companies, plant-based investments, and getting vegan food put on menus in place of animal foods. And you know, I, I like to think, again, as, of humans as being very conscientious. And there is that possibility. But oftentimes, if we put it in front of us, we eat it, right? So the more we get put, put plants in front of people instead of animal products, people start eating it. And then you know what happens if they're eating plant foods and you say eating animal foods is cruel? They feel validated. Yeah, you're right. I'm not doing But if they're eating animal products and you say eating animal products is cruel, now they feel attacked. Right? So there's, this, there's a big emotional component to this. And I think in our movement, you know, we have such a desire to end the suffering. And it's what we feel, but how do we do it? And, and, and that is a process we're still all learning from. So politically, there are things we can do. Money is a big part of government and how industry has been influential. They have the revolving door. The former USDA secretary under Obama, who was relatively good, is now working for the Dairy Export Council. You know, so you have this constant, and, and there's a lot of money there. Some of the largest animal groups have budgets of maybe 150 million, which is a lot of money. One dairy industry advertising campaign, 150 million. So it's kind of like we've got a pea shooter and we're going in a, against the tank, right? In terms of the resources and the machinery and the infrastructure. But besides the money, there's the people. And that's where I think we have a much stronger opportunity. You know, for many years, we tried to pass laws to ban some of the worst cruelties on factory farms, like gestation crates for pigs. And we would have legislation introduced. It would go to the Agriculture Committee, which is where all these bills go. Agriculture Committee is made up of lawmakers very friendly to agribusiness. And I remember being at these hearings and watching advocates pour out their heart. And you have these lawmakers, farmers, agricultural friendly people, playing solitaire on their laptops, right? So we were not able to pass those laws there. But then we went to the initiative process. We put a measure on the ballot, starting in Florida, then we did Arizona, then California, there have been a few others now, and asked people to vote on this. And every time citizens have had a chance to vote, they voted to ban these cruel practices. So when you take it to the people, I think we have opportunities. It's gonna be a long process, and I think that different approaches are okay, too. You know, so it's just because we're not totally unified isn't a weakness, necessarily. If we're fighting each other and spending a lot of energy, then that's a problem. But different approaches, I think, are healthy. What's your take on palm oil in vegan products? <laughs> Boy, palm oil. <laughs> yeah, right? Okay, so, you know, that's good, right? We're replacing butter and stuff. Now, palm oil. So these are real issues. It's easier to say that's a bad thing than to say, okay, here's the solution instead. So palm oil is something I try to avoid. You know, there are different ways that it is produced, but it is generally disruptive. You know, there are some companies, I think Dr. Bronner's, for example, that tries to do a good job of, you know, actually knowing the farmers and connecting with them and not destroying new land, but growing it on plantations where it's already been grown. But it's still not the ideal scenario. But what is the ideal scenario? Right, so, so this is where you know, I kind of see our shifting happening in a mass production system and then in a more grassrootsy, bottom-up system. And that's the ideal. So here you're talking about veganic, community-based agriculture, community gardens, CSAs, farmers markets, food not lawns, rooftop gardens, you know, school gardens, food right there in the neighborhood. So that's the ideal. But then you also have Burger King. You have this mass food system. And you have companies like Cargill. I did a panel discussion a while back with the CEO of Cargill. And I was wondering, what am I going to talk to this guy about? Because I didn't want to talk about their welfare standards. So we talked about the inefficiency of animal agriculture and the need to 
grow plants instead of animals, that way you don't have to cut down as many rainforests. So that was sort of the common ground. But Cargill and companies like that have sort of policies, like rainforest friendly policies, that I'm kind of skeptical of, right? So that they're saying it and they're recognizing it as an issue is good, but is it greenwashing? Maybe. So with palm oil, I try to avoid it and try to go to companies that I have more of a inclination to support or trust, you know, like Dr. Bronner's. But it's not easy. Just living on this planet, we cause harm. You know, you do the best you can, and sometimes you accept things that are, you know, and, and for different people, it will be different. Some people are gonna say, no palm oil, period. Some people will do it, you know, and, and, and then this is a matter of incremental changes for those of us who are still using that to do less and less, and hopefully not at some point. Yeah. You have all of the people that are trying to be vegan, and they love animals, and they have pets. So the question has to do is what about cats and dogs for people who are vegan, don't want to eat animal products, and they have cats and dogs? Well, the good news is for dogs, they can be vegan. My girlfriend and I foster dogs, we live with a couple that we ended up keeping, but, and they're vegan. So, so dogs can be vegan. Cats, I don't think they can, although there are some animal people that say they can't, but I've heard more people say they can't, so that's kind of what it seems like to me. So it's a dilemma. There's not a good answer there. And the reason that we have so many cats is because of the way human beings have created environments and in some cases bred them. And so now we've created the situation and now we, I think, have a responsibility to figure out the solution. And so of course spaying, neutering, lessening population, of course. But your question kind of raises the bigger question of, okay, what does the vegan world look like? You know, are there farm animals in it? You know, how do we interact with other animals? Do we have pets? I mean, there are some tweaks that say no pets. And for me, it has to do with what is the relationship? Is it one of mutuality, of mutual benefit? Or is it one of, of an abuse of power? And, and to me, in terms of companion animals, we, and human beings generally, we're a very dominant force on this planet, right? 